a recent Huffington Post article has highlighted the huge disadvantage for LGBTQ non-trans residents. In this article, you will learn about Leslie Lee Kim, as shown in the picture on the left side of the screen, and her experience of visiting her beloved friend of Roberts, as shown in the picture on the right side of the screen, who unfortunately passed away during the pandemic in June 2020. In this interview, she shared her experience and the difficulties in contacting and visiting her beloved friend Roberts during COVID-19 due to the visiting constraints in care facilities, the invisibility of his death among the care facility staff, and the delayed notification of his death to his chosen family members. Instead of retelling their stories, I encourage you to take a look at the article. Search for Nick Kim's online interviews. Instead, as a sociologist, I want to highlight and have a deeper conversations about the three factors that leaving LGBTQ older adults more vulnerable during COVID-19. Those three factors are social isolation of LGBTQ older adults, pre-existing health disparities. Often as a result of cumulative discrimination and the lack of recognition of the chosen family. First, isolation. Even before the pandemic, studies showed that LGBTQ older people were already twice as likely as their cisgender heterosexual counterparts to live alone. Further, LGBTQ older adults report higher rates of loneliness, isolation, and depression. In comparison to their cisgender heterosexual counterpart, it is unknown to what degree that these conditions may be magnified by social or physical distancing policies. Additionally, shelter-in-place, quarantine rules, the closure of community spaces, and the visiting constraints in long-term care facilities. Make it even harder for LGBTQ older people to get connected, find, or provide mutual support. Heartbreakingly, according to the LGBTQ older people and COVID-19 addressing higher risk social isolation and discrimination issue brief published in 2020 May, almost a quarter of LGBTQ older people have no one to call in case an in case of an emergency. Moreover, the Canadian report in 2018 shows that the need to conceal their sexual orientations, the fear of discriminations, and the homophobic, transphobic culture within some of the caregiving conditions, limited social interactions, or loss of social network, are all risk factors associated with a higher degree of LGBTQ seniors isolation. It's important to notice that in this report, it does not have data on the number of Canadians aged 65 or older who identify as LGBTQ. The next factor is the pre-existing health disparities. A study by the Center for American Progress found that quote 65% LGBTQ older people reported having pre-existing conditions such as diabetes, asthma. Heart disease or HIV compared to 51% of the U.S. population. Research also suggests that there is a general long-standing distrust of and reluctance to access healthcare among LGBTQ groups. This kind of distrust and reluctance can be accentuated as the course of aging, in part due to the cumulative discrimination over the years. Last but not the least, we have to recognize that. LGBTQ communities are not a homogenous community. Transgender individuals often face unique challenges in accessing healthcare resources to meet their unique health needs. Given their invisibility in the healthcare system, the continuing misgendering practices and the transphobic culture among the health providers. Lastly, I want to talk about. The importance of chosen family in caretaking LGBTQ older adults. Here, I borrow the definition of a U.S. national wide survey of LGBTQ older adults as a group of people to whom you are emotionally close, 
and consider family even though you are not biologically or legally related. Chosen family provides significant source of informal care for LGBTQ older adults. This is different from the experience of general population, where informal elder care is obligated by younger relatives or adult daughters. Non-relatives only perform 40% of elder care according to the study LGBT older adults, chosen family, and caregiving. In the LGBTQ community, however, older adults rely predominantly on each other for informal, emotional, financial, and physical support. Relatives only provide 11% of all care, and nearly two-thirds of LGBTQ older adults who aged between 45 and 64 reported they had a chosen family. More importantly, caretaking is mutual. More than 40% of LGBTQ older adults who are receiving care are also caregivers themselves. But this reliance on chosen family can be disturbed by the conditions of COVID-19 and the policies lacking recognition of chosen family. This is an excerpt from the article I just mentioned published in Huffington Post. Here, Ni Kim provided us with colloquial evidence showing how the measures imposed by the pandemic can, quote, took away his social life, unquote. The excerpt that I just show also highlights the lack of social and legal recognition of the chosen family standing can put LGBTQ older adults at a disadvantaged position and has serious consequences for their caretaking and living experience. Here we can see two common consequences of not having that social and legal recognitions. First, healthcare providers sometimes fail to respect partners or other chosen family members, instead defer to the wishes of the next of kin. But as we know, many LGBTQ older adults are estranged from their family of origin. Their wishes might totally differ from the wishes of their family of origin too. In addition, though many LGBTQ older people rely on chosen family for primary caretaking needs and support, but most of the limited existing paid leave laws do not cover chosen family. This means that the chosen family and friends will not be able to take time away from work in order to take care of their older friends, share health insurance plans, or make medical donations for one another because they do not have the legal recognition. As you can see, this is a complex and ongoing, perhaps exacerbated issues because of COVID-19 among the LGBTQ communities. But we do know that we need more policies that guarantee the equity on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, and the comprehensive anti-discrimination protections, cultural competency training in the healthcare facility context. Activists also call for legal reforms in recognizing the chosen family and diverse family forms, which we will talk more in future module. Finally, I want to draw your attention into the long-term care structure, which we briefly touched upon in the last topic. According to a most recent report, the Royal Society of Canada, Canada's response to COVID-19 has also exposed, quote, non-standing, widespread, and pervasive deficiencies in the long-term care sector, unquote. The proportion of total control COVID-19 deaths nursing home in Canada is 81% compared to 28% in Australia, 31% in the U.S., and 66% in Spain. For more details on the challenges facing nursing homes and what we can do better, please check out the bonus material for the full report. While you are going to the main lecture today, I want to focus on the concept of long-term care as a private trouble. While hospitals and physicians' care is regarded as a public issue and covered under the Canada Health Act, Long-term care remains outside university insured health services that is protected by the Canada Health Act. Like family and child care that are often regarded as a private trouble, the provision of care in later life is also primarily regarded as a private trouble. The care facilities received only by basic minimum provincial subsidy. In later life, 
families and caretakers often are left to their own devices to find and fund care for their elderly. With the privatization of healthcare in Canada, social economic status disadvantaged families might face even greater challenges to afford care for their elderly. Yet, privatization is an insidious force in healthcare in Canada. Even during COVID-19, we can see how government initiatives are still pushing ahead with their new homes and community care legislations. According to the Ontario Health Coalition, the legislation will further enable the privatization of home care and remove the existing provisions of public control and accountability. We know that Research has already shown that for-profit healthcare is more expensive and often of lower quality than non-for-profit or government care. Additionally, while healthcare is being privatized and professionalized, we might neglect the emotional support that the older people need, as well as their limited social capital, including informal support from their friends and family, formal social ties with volunteers and communities. Lastly, please pay attention to the privatization of home care is often compounded with the exploitative practices of labor, which is often gendered, unpaid, undervalued, marginalized, culturalized, highly racialized. Due to time constraints, we won't be able to fully investigate the complexity of organization and conditions of home care here. However, I hope this serves as a start for you to use sociological imagination to analyze the long-term care as a public and institutional crisis beyond COVID-19. Essentially, the conditions of work are the conditions of care. If the social isolation is promoted rather than physical isolation, if intergenerational conflict is promoted rather than the intergenerational care and solidarities, Older people's ability to cope with crises such as the current pandemic can diminish even further. While you are viewing the main lecture taught by Professor Annie Martin Matthews, I would encourage you to keep pondering those questions. What's the role of for-profit, private versus public sectors in this care space before and during COVID-19? I want to thank you for joining me in the journey of unpacking the generational event and the aging under COVID-19 with that intersectional lens. And now I will invite Catherine back to introduce the guest lecture of today's main lecture. I hope you enjoy it and please feel free to contact me by email.